Hey Internet, it's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings series. And for today's topic, several commenters have asked me to cover the Wars of Beleriand. So, I thought today I'd start by covering the first battle in the Wars of Beleriand. Now these wars happened thousands of years before the War of the Ring. In fact, the first battle is fought before the First Age, during the Years of the Trees. There are six battles that comprise the Wars of Beleriand, and most of those battles have really cool nicknames. The Battle Under Stars, the Glorious Battle, the Battle of Sudden Flame, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, <laughs> best name of all time. The War of Wrath. And then there's the first battle. No other name. By the way, the first battle was also a battle under stars. But does it get the credit? No. <laughs> it tends to get lost amidst the drama that comes after it. In fact, early on, Tolkien was going to have the Wars of Beleriand begin with the arrival of the Noldor in Middle-earth, uh, Feanor's crew. But in the Silmarillion, their arrival kicks off the second battle, the Battle Under Stars. So in some ways, the generically named first battle feels like an afterthought. So why cover it? What makes the first battle worth a Dork Lord of the Rings video? It's worthy because it gives us a unique insight into Middle-earth. This battle takes place during a short period of time, well, okay, during the years of the trees, no period of time is short, but a relatively short period of time between Morgoth returning to Middle-earth with the Silmarils and the Noldor arriving in Middle-earth to get the Silmarils back. So this battle gives us a glimpse of what Middle-earth would have looked like if the Noldor had listened to the Valar and stayed in the West. The First Age would have unfolded quite differently, for better and for worse, if the Noldor had stayed home. As we'll see, I think basically the first stage would have come down to Morgoth versus Thingol. So first, let's set the stage with a little background into the state of affairs in Middle-earth leading up to the first battle. Remember, since this is the years of the trees, pre-first age, pre-sun and moon, humans haven't awakened yet, so they're not on the scene. We're going to take it back before Melkor's arrival. So Melkor is still technically in captivity back in Amman. On the west coast of Beleriand, the elven lord Círdan, who we see in the Third Age ruling the Grey Havens, rules the Havens of Phallus. Just to clarify, the Havens of Phallus are not the same as the Grey Havens. A lot of similarities between the two, but by the time we get to the Grey Havens in the Third Age, the Havens of Phallus are deep, deep under the sea. They're gone. So that's Círdan's elves on the coast. Further inland, King Thingol and his incredibly powerful Maya spirit wife Melian have established the underground city of Menegroth, the Thousand Caves. And they're going to come into contact with other tribes of elves and the dwarves of Middle-earth, also known as the Naugrim. This is from the Silmarillion, Chapter 10. And when the building of Menegroth was achieved, and there was peace in the realm of Thingol and Melian, the Naugrim yet came ever and anon over the mountains and went in traffic about the lands. But they went seldom to Phallus, for they hated the sound of the sea and feared to look upon it. To Beleriand there came no other rumor or tidings of the world without. But as the third age of the captivity of Melkor drew on, the dwarves became troubled, and they spoke to King Thingol, saying that the Valar had not rooted out utterly the evils of the north. And now the remnant, having long multiplied in the dark, were coming forth once more and roaming far and wide. There are fell beasts, they said, in the land east of the mountains, and your ancient kindred that dwell there are flying from the plains to the hills. And ere long the evil creatures came even to Beleriand, over passes in the mountains, or up from the south, through the dark forests. Wolves there were, or creatures that walked in wolf shapes, and other fell beings of shadow, 
and among them were the orcs, who afterwards wrought ruin in Beleriand. But they were yet few and wary, and did but smell out the ways of the land, awaiting the return of their lord. Whence they came, or what they were, the elves knew not then, thinking them perhaps to be Avari, who had become evil and savage in the wild, in which they guessed all too near, it is said. So the dwarves hate the sea. They're not fans of the coast. But a place called the Thousand Caves sounds much better to them. And they bring word to Thingol that even though Melkor is still imprisoned, Middle-earth is not safe from a whole host of evil critters. And those critters have fellow elves on the run. And then we get this interesting passage about orcs. Quick side note, Tolkien changed his mind about the origin of the orcs over the years, but for the text of the Silmarillion, he went with the notion that orcs were former elves that Morgoth had tortured into this mockery of elvendom. So the quote reads, Whence they came, the orcs, or what they were, the elves knew not then, thinking them perhaps to be Avari, who had become evil and savage in the wild. The Avari, a.k.a. the unwilling, was the name given to the elves that refused to journey west. And here we have Thingol and the Sindar elves theorizing that maybe orcs are just savage Avari elves, which shows how little they regarded the Avari, right? Yeah, they're probably monsters. And then Tolkien adds, they guessed all too near, because orcs were in fact formerly elves, although they had a little help from Morgoth to transform. So, to Thingol's credit, he listens to the dwarves, and with their considerable help, he creates an armory, seemingly from scratch. Silmarillion, Chapter 10 Therefore Thingol took thought for arms, which before his people had not needed. And these at first the Naugrum smithied for him, for they were greatly skilled in such work, though none among them surpassed the craftsmen of Nogrod, of whom Telkar the smith was greatest in renown. A warlike race of old were all the Naugrum, and they would fight fiercely against whomsoever aggrieved them, servants of Melkor, or Eldar, or Avari, or wild beasts, or not seldom their own kin, dwarves of other mansions and lordships. Their smithcraft, indeed the Sindar, soon learned of them. Yet in the tempering of steel, alone of all crafts, the dwarves were never outmatched, even by the Noldor, and in the making of mail of linked rings, which was first contrived by the smiths of Belagost, their work had no rival. At this time, therefore, the Sindar were well armed, and they drove off all creatures of evil and had peace again. But Thingol's armories were stored with axes, and with spears and swords, and tall helms, and long coats of bright mail. For the hauberks of the dwarves were so fashioned that they rusted not, but shone ever as if they were new burnished. And that proved well for Thingol in the time that was to come. So, fortunately for Thingol, when Melkor eventually initiates the first battle, the Sindar come dress for the party. Side note about Telkar. The quote mentions that he was the dwarven smith of greatest renown. Among other things, Telkar is notable as the smith who forged Narsil, a sword that was broken, the same sword that was reforged to become Enderil. How Narsil came from a dwarven smith in the first age to a Lendil in the second age is unclear, but my best guess is that Telkar made the blade for Thingol, and the sword was passed down through his descendants all the way to Elros, Elrond's twin brother, first king of Numenor, hence eventually to Elendil. The only hitch to that theory is that Thingol had his own sword, Arenruth, which was passed down to Elros and eventually lost in the downfall of Numenor. So that suggests that Narsil was perhaps just another sword in the armory. In any event, at this time, Narsil is probably hanging on a wall in Menegroth, waiting to be used in the first battle. Okay, so Thingol has met the dwarves, armed himself to the teeth, fended off the evil critters roaming the land. But, I mentioned he also meets up with other groups of elves. Thingol's elves are called the Sindar, 
and they belong to a tribe of elves called the Teleri. He's about to meet up with another group of Teleri elves called the Nandor, those who go back. The Nandor began the journey west, reached the Anduin and thought, hey, this is actually pretty nice, why don't we just stay here? <laughs> and so they're led by Lenwe, but Lenwe's son, Denethor, not that Denethor, a few thousand years too early, <laughs> Denethor hears about Thingol and leads a group of the Nandor to join up with Thingol's elves. Now, as has been told, one Lenwe of the host of Olwe forsook the march of the Eldar at that time when the Teleri were halted by the shores of the Great River upon the borders of the Westlands of Middle-earth. Little is known of the wanderings of the Nandor, whom he led away down Anduin. Some, it is said, dwelt age-long in the woods of the Vale of the Great River. Some came at last to its mouths, and there dwelt by the sea. And yet others, passing by the White Mountains, came north again, and entered the wilderness of Eriador between Arid Luin and the far mountains of Mist. Now these were a woodland people, and had no weapons of steel, and the coming of the fell beasts of the north filled them with great fear, as the Nalgrim declared to King Thingol and Menegroth. Therefore Denethor, the son of Lenwe, hearing rumor of the might of Thingol and his majesty, and of the peace of his realm, gathered such host of his scattered people as he could, and led them over the mountains into Beleriand. There they were welcomed by Thingol, as kin, long lost that return. And they dwelt in Assyriand, the land of seven rivers. Of the long years of peace that followed after the coming of Denethor, there is little tale. In those days, it is said, Dairon the minstrel, chief lore master of the kingdom of Thingol, devised his runes, and the Nalgrim that came to Thingol learned them, and were well pleased with the device. Esteeming Dairon's skill higher than did the Sindar, his own people. By the Nalgrim, the Kirth were taken east over the mountains, and passed into the knowledge of many peoples. So Denethor leads these woodland elves into Beleriand, and they're welcomed by Thingol, and they take up residence in Assyriand. These elves become known as the Lyquendi, the Green Elves. And I included the passage about Dairon because I think it's really fascinating. Dairon is Thingol's minstrel and chief lore master, incredibly talented musician. He later plays the jerk in the tale of Baron and Luthien because he's in love with Luthien. That love is unrequited, and so out of jealousy, he outs Baron and Luthien's relationship to Thingol, which sets off a giant chain of events. But for now, Dairon is just a really smart guy who's also a virtuoso musician. He creates a runic language, Kirth. But the Sindar don't see the value in it. They're like, wow, well, good for you, nerd. It's the dwarves who see the value in it. As Tolkien writes, the dwarves were well pleased with the device, esteeming Dairon's skill higher than did the Sindar his own people. It's like, ouch! Yikes, yikes. Okay, anyway, when the Noldor arrive, they bring the alphabet devised by Feanor, Tengwar, and that becomes fairly popular. Kirth takes a back seat, but the dwarves love it. And Tolkien finishes that thought with an incredibly profound passage. He's explaining why the Sindar didn't bother to write anything down. This is regarding the Kirth runes. But they were little used by the Sindar for the keeping of records until the days of the war, and much that was held in memory perished in the ruins of Doriath, i.e. most of their knowledge was lost. But of bliss and glad life there is little to be said before it ends, as works fair and wonderful, while still they endure for eyes to see are their own record and only when they're in peril or broken forever do they pass into song. Beautiful words. I think he's saying that before the war, their lives were so generally blissful and happy that they just lived in the moment. There was no reason to archive their successes and joys because it felt like they had an endless supply. But then the grim reality of war made them realize the fleeting nature of their bliss 
making them want to record memories of earlier days. It's, it's really powerful prose. But back to the first battle. Okay, we now have our players. For the good guys, we've got Thingol, Círdan, Denethor, and the dwarves. And for the bad guys, we've got Morgoth. He's the reason the years of the trees come to an end. Because he and Ungoliant kill the trees of Valinor, for whom the age is named. Then he kills Fenwë, Feanor's dad, the High King of the Noldor, steals the Silmarils, and flees to Middle-earth, where he rebuilds the fortress of Angband. But Morgoth, as has before been told, returned to Angband and built it anew. And above its doors he reared the reeking towers of Thangorodrum. And the gates of Morgoth were but 150 leagues distant from the bridge of Menegroth, far and yet all too near. 150 leagues equals about 450 miles. Now the orcs that multiplied in the darkness of the earth grew strong and fell, and their dark lord filled them with a lust of ruin and death. And they issued from Angband's gates under the clouds that Morgoth sent forth, and passed silently into the highlands of the north. Thence on a sudden a great army came into Beleriand and assailed King Thingol. Now in his wide realm many elves wandered free in the wild, or dwelt at peace in small kindreds far sundered. And only about Menegroth, in the midst of the land, and Phallus, in the country of the mariners, were their numerous peoples. But the orcs came down upon either side of Menegroth, and from camps in the east and west in the plains they plundered far and wide, and Thingol was cut off from Círdan. Therefore he called upon Denethor, and the elves came in force from Assyriand, and fought the first battle in the wars of Beleriand. And the eastern host of the orcs was taken between the armies of the Eldar, and they were utterly defeated. And those that fled north from the great slaughter were waylaid by the axes of the Naugrim that issued from Mount Dolmed. Few indeed returned to Angband. So if we just stop reading there, it sounds like a great outcome. Done and dusted, good guys win. Not so fast. Uh, but just to sum up, soon after Morgoth rebuilds Angband, he does an all-out assault on the elves of Middle-earth. Now, he doesn't know that the Noldor are coming, but he might fear some type of retribution from the Valar, so he's trying to control Middle-earth as quickly as possible. And he sends out two forces that envelop Menegroth, one to the east and one to the west. The western force takes on Círdan and the elves from Phallus. Thingol chooses to take on the eastern force with the help of Denethor's green elves and the dwarves from Mount Dolmed, and they kick X. But there's a cost. But the victory of the elves was dear bought, for those of Assyrian were light armed and no match for the orcs who were shod with iron and iron-shielded and bore great spears with broad blades. And Denethor was cut off and surrounded upon the hill of Amon Ereb. There he fell, and all his nearest kin about him, before the host of Thingol could come to his aid. Bitterly, though, his fall was avenged, when Thingol came upon the rear of the orcs and slew them in heaps. His people lamented him ever after, and took no king again. After the battle, some returned to Assyriand, and their tidings filled the remnant of their people with great fear, so that thereafter they came never forth in open war, but kept themselves by wariness and secrecy. And they were called the Lyquendi, the Green Elves, because of their raiment of the color of leaves. But many went north and entered the guarded realm of Thingol, and were merged with his people. So Denethor and all of his nearest kin are tragically slain in battle atop Amon Ereb, the Lonely Hill. Think Erebor, Lonely Mountain. And this has a giant ripple effect on the Green Elves. First, there's never another king of the Lyquendi. Denethor is the last. And second, they're done with fighting. Those that don't join up with Thingol go back to Assyriand and live a reclusive, isolationist existence. But 
the eastern arm of Morgoth's forces has been crushed. What about that western arm? Thingol is about to find out. And when Thingol came again to Menegroth, he learned that the orc host in the west was victorious, and had driven Círdan to the rim of the sea. Therefore he withdrew all his people that his summons could reach, and Melian put forth her power, and fenced all that dominion round about with an unseen wall of shadow and bewilderment, the girdle of Melian, that none thereafter could pass against her will or the will of King Thingol, unless one should come with a power greater than that of Melian the Maya. And this inner land was after called Doriath, the guarded kingdom, land of the girdle. Within it there was yet a watchful peace, but without there was peril and great fear, and the servants of Morgoth roamed at will, save in the walled havens of Phallus. But new tidings were at hand, which none in Middle-earth had foreseen. Neither Morgoth in his pits, nor Melian in Menegroth, for no news came out of Amon, whether by messenger, or by spirit, or by vision and dream, after the death of the trees. In this same time, Feanor came over the sea in the white ships of the Teleri, landed in the firth of Drengist, and there burned the ships at Lusgar. Okay, more giant ripples to the timeline. Thingol returns from the east to find that Morgoth's western army has pushed Círdan all the way back within the walls of the havens of Phallus, and they're laying siege to that region. And here he makes a puzzling decision. He just routed the eastern orcs with the help of the green elves and the dwarves. But upon hearing that Círdan really needs his help, instead of heading west with his army, he calls in all the nearby elves and bunkers in for over 500 years. Círdan can't get to Doriath under Thingol and Melian's protection. He's trapped on the coast. And I think the text suggests that if the Noldor hadn't arrived unexpectedly, surprising everyone, including Morgoth and Melian, Círdan and the elves at Phallus would have been defeated. So it feels like Thingol abandoned his kin. Now, maybe he'd suffered too many losses in the battle in the east and figured he just didn't have a strong enough army to break the siege. As it turns out, the Noldor break the siege for him. But the host of Morgoth, aroused by the tumult of Lemoth and the light of the burning at Lusgar, came through the passes of the Mountains of Shadow and assailed Feanor on a sudden, before his camp was full wrought or put in defense. And there on the grey fields of Mithrim was fought the second battle in the wars of Beleriand, Dagger Nuin Giliath, it is named, the battle under stars, for the moon had not yet risen, and it is renowned in song. Now, see? All the other battles get cool names. I digress. Okay. <laughs> the Noldor, outnumbered and taken at unawares, were yet swiftly victorious, for the light of Amon was not yet dimmed in their eyes, and they were strong and swift and deadly in anger, and their swords were long and terrible. The orcs fled before them, and they were driven forth from Mithrim with great slaughter, and hunted over the mountains of shadow into the great plain of ard -Galen. There the armies of Morgoth that had passed south and beleaguered Círdan in the havens of Phallus came up to their aid and were caught in their ruin. So the army of Morgoth sees the light of Feanor burning the ships at Lascar. He and the Noldor have just arrived. And so the orcs mount an ambush to catch these newcomers unawares, only to immediately find out that they're way outmatched. These elves from the west are supercharged and decimate the orcs, sending them running. As they run, they are fortuitously met by the army currently besieging Phallus. So those two armies merge and still get crushed. <laughs> it's a rout. The orcs are defeated. Phallus is no longer under siege. And the only real downside, it's a big downside, is that Feanor is killed while giving chase to the retreating army. But that's the second battle. The first battle is now officially over. So what are the after effects of the first battle of the Wars of Beleriand? Thingol and the Green Elves become reclusive, refusing to join in the wars to come. 
Thingo uses the same tactic I use when I play real-time strategy games like Age of Empires. The all-out defense tactic is known as turtling, but it should probably be called the Dorius strategy. But even if he wasn't bunkered down, Thingol hates the Noldor when he learns that they killed his fellow Teleri during the kin slaying, and then kept it a secret from him for several years. He swears them off. Melian casts the incredibly powerful Girdle of Melian, and for hundreds of years, the safest place to be in Middle-earth is Doriath. But that's mainly because the rest of Middle-earth is so damn dangerous. I'm currently covering Marvel's What If series, so here's a Middle-earth What If. What if the Noldor had stayed in the West? On the one hand, I think Círdan's elves at Falas, the Falathrum, would have been doomed. But I think the Girdle of Melian would have held. Morgoth would have conquered just about everything except Menegroth, and potentially one or two of the Dwarven kingdoms. Now the Edain, who awoke at the beginning of the First Age, crossed into Beleriand around the year 300. In the real timeline, they met and befriended various members of the Noldor, notably Finrod and Fingolfin, and thus became allies against Morgoth. But in this alternate reality, there are no Noldor, and by the time they arrive, around the year 300, Morgoth's got nearly total control, probably laying siege to Doriath. So the Edain are left to their own devices, and perhaps some of them maybe even take up with the wrong side? It seems like only a matter of time before Doriath also falls. But on the other hand, if things went differently for Baron and his people, never having met the Noldor, he might never have come to Doriath, hence never fallen in love with Luthien, hence never stole a Silmaril to prove his love, hence Thingol never requisitions Dwarven Smiths to place the Silmaril in the Nauglamir, and hence he avoids getting murdered by the Dwarves, which sets up a millennia-long enmity between the two cultures. Anyway, so there you go, the often overlooked, but nonetheless dramatic, first battle of the Wars of Beleriand. Thank you to everyone who suggested this topic. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Bye!